I'm not normally embarrassed by the extent of my subject uh, at the beginning, but I, I, I can hardly compete with the, the idea of explaining all behavior and social activity from fundamental axioms of physics. So I'm going to focus on a much smaller problem, which is trying to understand the visual system in the mouse. And I'll, I'll motivate this uh, through the course of this talk. But it actually comes from a, a deeply held philosophical belief about research, which is if you can choose the right problem and, and dig into it uh, deeply enough, then, then you're likely to learn lessons that will, will inspire the solution to other related problems and, in, in fact, help you even to uh, be able to formulate them. And, and so for those of you who don't care about uh, biological visual systems, I've changed the intro to the talk based on several of the comments that I heard yesterday and today, uh, which is about the rise of AI in science and in our culture in general. So Priya, this is my attempt to get large again. And, and the question is whether these artifacts are actually doing things like this other intelligent machine uh, that we know about, uh, at least at the level of our visual systems. And, and as, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, uh, deep networks came uh, uh, out of uh, a, a very crude analogy with a very crude model from the late 1970s uh, by, by David Hubel and, and Torsten Wiesel uh, modeling the early visual system in, in the cat. And this model has now been extended into uh, uh, the foundation of much of the deep learning aspect of modern AI. And, and there is, in fact, a something of a Manhattan Project going on that wants to build an identity between these deep networks and the structure, at least, of visual systems. And, and frankly, I was, I was struck a lot by your comment yesterday about whether we're writing papers that are only to be read by machine. And uh, that uh, takes this actually to, to a much higher level. Is, is the nature of this intelligence anything like uh, uh, what we would call intelligence? Well, I, I don't know the answer to the big question, but I'm going to try to address that, at least at the level of, of uh, the visual system. And, and so, so how might you go about this? And my, my goal here is to set the stage and, and introduce our algorithmic approach to this. Well, there's some unknown neural network in, in say, a visual system. And we excite it with some stimulus of one sort or another. And we, we record the activity. We measure the activity. And, and I believe the philosophers in this room would call that an experiment. Uh, and, and the question is, once you do an experiment, what do you do with, with all those data? Uh, in our case, uh, we're going to deal with, with the mouse because it is the the system of choice for much of modern biology. And, and so these mice, are, mice are, are pretty good at wandering uh, through the world and surviving. And so, so there's, there's sort of three questions, which, is, which are, what are the stimuli that we should use to excite the visual system of the mouse in a non-trivial fashion? And how do we build some notion of what the circuits might be that are underlying that activity. And we would like to be able to do this by analyzing the data that we acquire uh, through experiments. Now, there's, there's uh, something of a history to this subject, which, which is very anti-mouse, which, which if you take the mouse and put it in the laboratory, as uh, we would all go to the ophthalmologist and measure the acuity of these animals, it turns out that, that mice are effectively blind. That is to say, uh, if I asked how well you could see something small, like say your thumbnail held at arm's length. So your thumbnail at arm's length is about one degree of visual angle. And the, the acuity of a mouse with respect to that is only less than 10 percent as good as being able to see something like your thumbnail. So if a primate were viewing a scene like the one that you see here on the right, then it would see a pattern like this blurry mess over there. So, so this says that uh, 
maybe the mouse is not the right creature to be using for uh, visual experiments, despite the fact that there's so much known about it genetically and, and, and biologically uh, and so many imaging capabilities. Uh, but if you go down a level, you see that the, the, the neural machinery in the mouse is very analogous to the neural machinery in cats as Hubel and Wiesel used them or in the primate. Maybe, maybe there's something else that's going on here that requires a little bit of understanding, and that is, is the stimulus that your ophthalmologist would use to design your glasses the right kind of stimulus to be using in evaluating the visual system of the mouse. So we thought about that, and, and, and from a mathematician's perspective, what do mice do? Well, they run around in fields looking for crickets and other things to eat. So if you picture yourself as a mouse running through a field, there's lots of grass and shrubbery and whatnot at the scale that matters to you. And so as you're running through the field, you see this kind of waterfall of shrubbery and grass flowing by. And this led us as mathematicians to build a collection of flow patterns that are an abstraction of that class of visual stimuli. And my colleague, uh, Michael Stryker, has used these flow patterns to assess the visual system of the mouse. And there's a, there's a key data science point here, which is the flows are much more naturalistic than, than uh, the artificial stimuli that you see on the left side of your screen. But they're also much more amenable to analysis than, than natural images, which are essentially an uncontrolled class of, of stimuli uh, that you see on the right. So to get the experiments to work, you need to be somewhat cognizant of the stimuli. Now, how are these experiments done? We, we, we're the mathematicians. This is all done by my colleague Michael Stryker at UCSF. And the game is played as follows. We need to record from the mouse while the mouse is running around in what it thinks of as a naturalistic situation, looking at this, these flow patterns going by on computer screens. And this is done with a very clever uh, uh, scheme developed by David Tank in which you bolt the mouse's head to a uh, fixed object so you can insert electrodes to do recordings. But at the same time, the mouse is standing on a ball of styrofoam, which is elevated by a jet of air. And the moment of inertia of the styrofoam ball is the same as the mouse. So the mouse is running around on this ball looking at our computer screens. We can record from his brain because it's immobilized, but the mouse thinks he's running around through the world, or at least that's our sense of what we think is going on. Now, with that set up, we can evaluate the response to these flow patterns, and this becomes a little bit technical here, and I'm trying to not be technical in this talk, but you can see from this rendition of what are called the receptive fields of the visual neurons in the mouse's brain that there's a lot of structure to the flow that's at a much higher frequency than the size of these receptive fields. And here, the red lobe indicates an excitatory and the blue lobe indicates an inhibitory portion of the visual field that the mouse cares about. And, and to make a non-technical observation of the summary of the data, mice love these scenes. They love these visual flow stimuli. They respond at, at two and a half, maybe three octaves higher in frequency to these artificial stimuli. Contrast matters a lot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, if you look at the cells in mouse cortex that care only about the gratings, about the classic stimuli, it's a small percentage. And so, so this is lesson number one. You need to be very careful about making sure that you're exercising the system, at least in a non-trivial way, to the problems that you have. The second is a data science problem, which is once we have this ensemble of stimuli, the analysis question becomes much more difficult, which is how to analyze the response of a visual system to an entire ensemble of stimuli. Now, we have 
recordings from, let's say, a thousand neurons to each of the stimuli in this ensemble, in this behaving situation. And so there is a, a popular approach to analyzing this, and this is right at the heart of what's going on in computational, in the bulk of computational neuroscience these days, where you show the mouse the stimulus, you record from a thousand neurons, you measure the response to neuron one, to stimulus one, the response of neuron two to stimulus two, dot, 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 the response of neuron a thousand to, and you do that for each of the stimuli. It's a high dimensional space. You reduce dimensionality with traditional techniques like PCA, and you get what's called a perceptual manifold. Now, the key thing about this perceptual manifold is each point is a stimulus, and they're in coordinates that relate to the activity of mice, the principal components of, of the stimulus. Key thing, each dot in this manifold, each point on this manifold is a trial. So if you imagine yourself walking around on this, as you walk on the manifold, you're walking trial to trial to trial. What the manifold is telling you about is, in the context of the brain, how do the trials relate to one another? Well, this is extremely useful if your job is to decode what you think the mouse was looking at. And, and for that reason, these, these, these kinds of techniques are used a lot in, in brain implants and other such things where you want to decode a stimulus from the activity. Um, in understanding the visual system, however, we're not out to build a prosthesis. We're out to figure out what the circuits are. These manifolds describe which trials are similar. What we want to know is what are the neurons doing? That is to say, we need something like the inverse of that manifold. So instead of representing trials in neural coordinates, we need to represent neurons in coordinates that relate not only to the trials, but to the individual responses. And we've developed an approach to building this manifold, and we call it the neural encoding manifold, because it's in a sense the inverse to the standard decoding manifold. The key point on this manifold is neurons live in neighborhoods where they respond similarly to the stimulus ensemble in time to the other neurons around them. So neurons nearby on this manifold are likely to be involved in functional circuits. Neurons far away are doing something rather different. And the, the hope is that once we understand this manifold, it'll tell us something about abstract functional circuitry, which can then tell us something about real circuitry. So here's, here's the way it looks with real data. This is the striker setup at UCSF, but because, as I described it, the visual system in the mouse responds so surprisingly to these flow stimuli that we thought we'd better take a look at the input to the cortex. And so we teamed up with Greg Field, who's now at UCLA, and so we have exactly analogous presentations of our stimulus ensemble to the cortex and to the retina of mice under comparable conditions. And that's a, the siloing effect that we'll see. Um, so the stimulus ensemble is, of course, all the classic stimuli because we need to relate to the activity of the rest of the neuroscience world, but also a collection of these flow stimuli that represent what a mouse would be doing in a more naturalistic setting. And they're designed so that we can titrate out various aspects of, of stimulus properties that we think the mouse knows uh, it, it would be interested in. This is a real version of that decoding manifold, the classic approach. And you can see from this that the different groups of stimuli form clouds in that space. So it would be relatively trivial from a machine learning perspective to design decoding algorithms to say what stimulus the mouse was looking at. You see the beautiful clustering here in visual cortex of the mouse. Well, what does it look like in the retina? The clusters are even more separate. The margins are bigger. The decoding problem is easier. 
So if you wanted to solve this kind of problem, you're better off using a retina than a brain. <laughs> so what's going on in the brain? The brain is already doing something much more complicated, which seems to make the classical decoding issue a rather different one. So how we, will we approach this? Let me just familiarize you with the way we present, I will be presenting the data, and that is think of a particular retinal ganglion cell, and it sees a bunch of stimuli drifting by in different directions. Some of these are grading patterns, some of these are flows of various sorts. And so for each one of these, we get a map, which is the direction of flow versus the time since the stimulus came on. And you can see here that if, the, if this particular neuron was selective for this region of visual space, as the stimulus came by, it would quiet, quiet, quiet. And you could see that as in one of these directions of flow, quiet, quiet. So red means lots of activity. Black means not much activity. You get a similar kind of picture in the visual cortex, except now it's a li little bit more structured. In visual cortex, neurons tend to care about whether it's drifting this way with a grading of that orientation or drifting this way with a grading of that orientation. And so you get the same kind of distribution of responses here, but a bit more refined, okay? This is two classic examples. You could find cells exhibiting this behavior in the hubel wiesel experiments that I talked about at the beginning. What happens if you show the entire ensemble of six stimuli? And that's why I'm going through this so you get familiar with thinking of the different stimulus class as one of the positions in this array of activity for each of the cells. Well, that cell in V1 that I showed with the classical hubel wiesel response didn't care about any of the other stimuli. That's a very classical cell. Those are the ones on which deep networks are based. Most cells don't respond that way in, in the visual cortex. Most cells, for example, this one, has no interest in low frequency gratings and has beautiful responses tuned to orientation to high frequency gratings or to flow patterns that have orientation structure. It doesn't like unoriented or just dot kinetic motion patterns at all unless the contrast is negative, okay? What's going on here? Here's another retinal ganglion cell. This is the one I showed at the beginning, right? There's those, those bursts of activity as the low frequency grading drifted by. It loves high frequency gratings it loves positive contrast flows. It doesn't respond at all to negative contrast flows. Right? What's going on here? Every neuron is giving a response in different ways to this ensemble of stimuli. This is a pretty complicated system to begin to understand. That's why we're trying to build this encoding manifold so that we can begin to understand how these properties are represented in the visual system. Now, the heart of the matter in doing this, for those of you familiar with, with machine learning ideas, this becomes a very technical problem in manifold inference. I'm going to skip over all those details, other than to give you a sense of how the mathematics works behind this, which is to say we have a collection of neurons, each of which is responding to an ensemble of stimuli, and a response is given as a function in time. So this is a tensor of data, and the question is how to say which points in that tensor of data are similar to one another. Well, points are going to be neurons. So look at, for example, neuron I over here. It likes low frequency gratings, and it likes negative contrast flows, and it has a strong transient aspect to its response to the flows that you don't really see with the gratings, okay? Notice that neuron I and neuron K are really similar to each other in their response to the ensemble. And so we can build what's called a kernel which measures that. And this is a very technical aspect of things. But what it says is neurons I and K should be close by each other on this manifold. Now, neurons I and J, which are responding quite differently. Notice that I like the negative contrast flows. J didn't like those at all. J liked 
positive contrast flows, I didn't respond to those at all. So I and K are close, J is far away. You build a graph of these data, distances in this graph are given by this similarity kernel. In the limit as the number of neurons gets large, there's a convergence in a certain technical sense of that graph to a manifold, and that's what we're calling the neural encoding manifold. Okay? So nearby, each point is a neuron, points nearby are responding similar to the ensemble. This is what the data really looks like for the retina. As I show it, well, it's projected down into three dimensions, but as I show it, even just projected down to three dimensions, you immediately see that this is a highly clustered representation of the neurons. There are places where the neurons are very dense in this representation, and the places where it's dense are separated by areas that are pretty empty of neurons. And so this highly clustered representation for the retina seems to be curious. Remember, every point in this representation is a neuron. So since it's a neuron, we know it's everything about its response to our ensemble of stimuli. Neurons that are in the same cluster are, by definition, near each other on the manifold, these high-density areas on the manifold. So they exhibit similar responses to similar aspects of the stimulus ensemble. If I go to a different cluster, I find a very different profile of responses to our ensemble. If I go to a different neuron in that cluster, it looks the same. So as I walk across this manifold, I see high density of cells that are responding similarly. Boom, then a big jump into cells that are responding differently. Boom, a big jump into cells that are responding differently. And I keep doing that. I can walk over the whole manifold, and I can keep doing that. Why would you expect that to be the case? It turns out that these clusters are not arbitrary. They relate to what's known about the structure of the retina, which is retinal ganglion cells are organized into classes. In the mouse, there's thought to be maybe up to about 40 such classes. It's thought that in, in human primates, there's maybe 20 such classes. In these 40 classes, they have names, they have characterization, they have properties. The neurons in these clusters are representing all those properties, okay? This is not to say that not much was added to retinal physiology, but I would like you to read this as saying this is a confirmation in some sense that our algorithms are at least doing something appropriate with regard to neural activity because it's learning in a completely unsupervised fashion much of the structure of what was known about retinal ganglion cell properties, okay? V1, visual cortex, the first area that processes visual information. In <coughs> human primates, it's in the occipital lobe, way back here in the back of your brain. And what do these look like? The manifold for the cortex is, to the extent that we can characterize it, completely continuous. You notice there's this beautiful, high-dimensional structure. It's hard to tell in this low-dimensional projection. There's this beautiful high-dimensional structure with this low-dimensional arm coming out of the side. There were several years of mathematical and computational work in trying to develop algorithms for manifold inference that work properly in what are called non-pure manifolds in mathematics. Manifolds where, it, it, where the data change their local intrinsic dimension. How will we characterize these continuous manifolds. Well, each point is a neuron, so we could stand on a neuron, we could look at its properties, and then we could start, so for example, if we stood on this neuron over here, we could look at its properties. As we start to walk along a geodesic on this manifold, we can encounter other neurons, and they have different properties. And you see, as long as you go along pathway one, as cartooned in this diagram, we go from neurons that prefer 
all the stimuli, highly promiscuous with regard to our stimulus ensemble, to neurons that really only like flow patterns. And so we go from neurons over in this corner that like everything to neurons over here that really only like flows. What if we went along the opposite and opposite direction on this manifold? We see that, again, the properties change, but as you walk along that direction, what you lose is selectivity for low-frequency gradings, responsi responsiveness to low-frequency gradings. Well, we can characterize many aspects of the structure of the physiology here. That's not what this talk is about. But I just want you to get this kind of picture of how beautifully continuous this structure is and how we can characterize various aspects of it. Remember, in the beginning, I talked about the importance of the stimuli, the difficulty of working only with the classical low-frequency gratings is these are the neurons that care about those primarily. It's only this low-frequency arm. So a lot of vis visual physiology is based on one actually quite special branch of the manifold of neurons in visual cortex. These neurons over here on this side that liked everything, they're primarily inhibitory interneurons because, it, and, and in fact, it's known that there, there are many properties of inhibitory interneurons that lead them to respond widely to different classes of stimuli. We can take this on and on, and we can characterize many physiological properties about the distribution and densities of neurons at different layers, how they're related to each other. That's all visual neuroscience. Why would you expect this topological diversity that we found in these two manifolds to arise? This is, this is a, a real segregation in the nature of the computations going on. Well, one of the areas we work on in my building a lot is spectral graph theory. So here's spectral graph theory in three seconds, okay? If you have a collection of neurons that are tightly coupled to each other in a functional network, then the manifold corresponding to that graph will be a, a, a dense, uh, continuous little cluster. If you have several of these circuits and they're distinct from one another, then you'll have a discontinuous manifold represented in the stimulus response ex extrinsic coordinates. If you start to add some weak coupling between these, then some of these islands start to connect up to each other a little bit. So you have a big island structure with some weak interconnections in between them. And we think that's what's going on in the retina. The weak interconnections in the retina are, are what are called amacrine cells or gap junctions between retinal ganglion cells, et cetera. We know a lot about the physiology and anatomy that could underlie that. In cortex, the game is completely different. Zillions of neurons are connected to zillions of other neurons, and the situation is much higher dimensional, much richer, much more densely interconnected. So all this makes a lot of sense. That's the intro. That's the science that we care about. Here's the part that may be relevant for you. Right? I said at the beginning, we have these deep, deep networks. We started to work with visual networks, but we're, yeah, there, there's a lot more to be said. So we can now ask this question, not at the level of does a unit in a deep network resemble a unit in the retina or a unit in the brain, but does the topology of the encoding manifold in the artificial network represent one of these structures, okay? Yeah, I won't embarrass anybody by asking, okay? So here's what you do. The first question you're worried about, I know, is, well, is AI an appropriate object for us to be working with? Because the fact that we can technically interrogate it exactly the same way that we interrogate the biological data isn't so much the point. Is it appropriate? So what are these deep, deep networks? This is ResNet 50, a, 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 a classic uh, computer vision network. It's trained on this famous library of, of natural scenes called, called ImageNet. Uh, there are millions of them. And it has this spectacular ability to classify uh, in instances of these scenes into, for example, spider webs or one of a thousand or so other categories. This has been uh, all over the cover of Nature. It's been all over the cover of the New York Times. You all know this story, okay? So we can feed it our stimuli. They're, they're just images. We feed it our stimuli, 
And if, for example, we look at the activity across the layers of one of these networks, you see, we see that for ImageNet-like patterns or our patterns, we get similar kinds of activity distributions, okay? What's the output? These networks happily classify our stimuli as, for example, positive contrast flows are spider webs. And, and ResNet does that with 93.5% uh, confidence. So, so we think that's with regard to, uh, I don't know if that's a prediction or a causation, but uh, that's a pretty confident uh, prediction of, uh, that's a pretty confident estimation of one sort or another. What does the manifold look like? It's even more clustered than the retina. Remember, the way I showed individual, so in this case, we call them units rather than neurons because they're the, they're the equivalent in, in uh, these deep networks. If you were to inter look, look at the responses plotted the same way for one of these units, you'd say, ah, oh, that's, that's pretty similar to the kinds of units, some of the kinds of units that we saw in the visual system. Do they tile space the way that retinal ganglion cells do? Yes, they do. There's a beautiful tiling of space in the same way that retinal ganglion cells tile space. But in retrospect, that shouldn't be a surprise because all these tricks that are used to make these networks trainable, like weight sharing, are in fact imposing that uh, as a condition. So even though individually these things kind of look like neurons, globally they look and enjoy the properties of something more like a retina than like a brain. These are big retinas. These are not little brains. Hmm. You can go across different layers, different uh, networks, etc. Same thing holds. So what I tried to illustrate by taking this deep dive into the visual system is building up a, an infrastructure for understanding populations of neurons' responses at, in respect to an ensemble of stimuli across time, the full set of data that you need to worry about, leads to very different ways of thinking about things and opened a direction into comparing deep networks with retinas, with V1. Very specific retinal ganglion cell types look very much like certain of the units in these deep networks. V1 is distributed very, very differently. V1 is this continuous manifold, and we think that it's that continuous manifold that forms the substrate out of which the emergent phenomena that Priya, I think, would call cognitive activity uh, can emerge. That's not the case in uh, the retina. Uh, from these algorithms, you can compute dimensionality, and you see the, the lowest dimensional objects are the ones from the artificial networks. The intermediate dimension stuff is the retina, which has some of this amacrine cell-mediated behavior introduced, but cortex, even the first visual area of cortex is uh, drastically different. Uh, this was a big team effort. We, we did uh, the computational work here. Mike's group at UCSF did the uh, uh, cortical work. Greg Field at, uh, was at Duke, now is at UCLA, did uh, the retina stuff. And I'd like to just uh, underline the fact that this was a spectacular collaboration between experimentalists of different breeds and theoreticians of different breeds. And uh, we think that's really the future of all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> Thanks for cracking open one case where you have managed to decode what ResNet actually does with spatial you know, broken up how the inference actually happens within ResNet mm. by mapping it onto actually retinal cells, real physical entities. So cracking open that proverbial black box that we've all talked about. So a question to Joe and then stop. Thanks. One of the things I really like about this, this setup is the way that you've got not just the changing you know, visual flow, but also more or less correlated with the movement of the mouse, even though the mouse is stable because of the ball arrangement. But I'm curious, 
whether there's any, you know, what the arrangement is for the, you know, for figuring in the mouse's head and eye movements, which, of course, you know, which are not constrained, I take it. Right. And, the head, the head and which are is clearly constrained. part of, of, of the actual tracking of changing visual, you know, you know, your movement in relation to the movement around is, is really important in vision. So how does, how does that play into this kind of project? Uh, oh, and so great question. Uh, uh, we worried about that a lot. <laughs> and and uh, the head is fixed. Uh, ah, but but okay. the, eyes, the, yeah, eyes, yeah, the eyes can move. So, so Mike recorded eye movements, mm -hmm. and then Greg, who did an exogenous recording with pieces of retina, moved the stimulus around as if it were being seen through those eye ah, movements. So, so that correlated to the eye movements. That's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really cool. And, and in fact, we use actual eye movements. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. that would be the point. Yeah, yeah. Hi, thanks for all the great talk. Uh, so could you repeat, I missed it, how did you pick three as the uh, embedding dimension of the lower dimension manifold? And uh, also- How did we pick three? Mm -hmm. oh, 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 because three makes for a nice video. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how, really know how to display four dimensions at once. And also, did you, uh, like- We know a lot about the intrinsic dimension in these manifolds. Mm -hmm. Cool. And also, do you happen to look into, uh, since you were looking at the topology of that manifold, did you look for non-trivial homology, do any topological analysis, other non-trivial cycles, like in those things that are branching out? Yeah, no, uh, th thus far, yeah, so uh, thus far we've been able to characterize uh, uh, only certain aspects of the topology because we're restricted to, we have about 1,500 neurons from the retina, about 1,500 from the cortex, and if we start to look for uh, uh, things like persistent homology and that other stuff, that induces a, an artificial clustering on all this uh, by the way that neighborhoods are grown. So we actually experimented some of those techniques, but have not been using them. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I had a question about the kind of implications or consequences of your results. So are you thinking of this as um, something about the architecture of the neural network as deciding this, or is it something about the problem that's allowing the architecture to take on this kind of retinal neuron versus right. brain neuron? We, yeah, we, well, well, they're coupled, right? The, the, the retina has a very particular cytoarchitecture. The cortex of the mouse has a very particular cytoarchitecture. That, there, there are certain macroscopic details of the cytoarchitectural organization of the mouse that do not have certain properties of, of uh, advanced primates, advanced mammals actually, like, like primates or cats, which are called orientation columns and other such uh, activities. So one of the technical motivations for this work from the physiology side is in order to do the geometric processing that it's thought that orientation hypercolumns support, do you need the hypercolumn organization? And because that's lacking in the mouse, except at a crude statistical level. And what this, what this implies is, no, you do not need that organization, at least at the level of the first visual area. Of course, there's much higher level stuff going on beyond what I talked about here, but yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Thank you. Okay, so, uh, thanks, Steve, again.